So diving in, as uh, as Paul said, my name is Mark Kurtz. I'm also joined here by my colleague, Michael Goyne, uh, who will be on to answer any questions anybody has during the session. Um, so feel free to use the chat feature or the Q&A feature. Uh, we'll be going through and uh, take a look at those, and Mike will be going through and answering those. So just running through today's agenda, uh, we'll go through a background on sparsification, so algorithms and techniques, as well as what are the motivations and results for doing sparsification, um, as, as we're talking about, especially for performance. And then we'll talk, talk over what it looks like to actually sparsify uh, the v 5 models, uh, specifically going through something called sparse transfer learning, as well as trying to sparsify from scratch. And, uh, and then uh, we'll go through deploying with our deep sparse inference engine, which is where we get uh, our performance. So we'll talk through what it takes, uh, specifically exporting to Onyx, and then running it through uh, our deep sparse installables with either our Python or our server API. And then we'll end with uh, next steps in discussion. So running through the background, one thing is, is what is sparsification? Well, it's a collection of methods and techniques for removing redundancies from neural networks uh, that results in smaller, faster, and equally as accurate models. Uh, so looking at the current trends in deep learning, uh, it's larger and larger networks. And we can see this on the right as we're looking at even the YOLO v5 models, right? And the YOLO v5 uh, p6 models. Um, as we want to scale in accuracy, we scale up the model size. Uh, especially whenever we get towards large language models, the size of these models is huge, right? We have hundreds of billions of parameters, and it's no surprise that not all of those are actually required. What may be surprising, though, is that even the smallest networks have significant redundancies in them, which we can actually get rid of and leverage for compute. So at Neuralmagic, we open source and productize sparsification to make it as easy as possible for you uh, to apply it to any model and then deploy it anywhere with CPUs at GPU class performance. Oh, so I apologize on the slides, not sure why they're messing up here, but um, running through, let me just get all of these on the uh, on the board. Um, but most weights in a neural network are actually useless. So pathways that were important for training are no longer needed. So we can remove them through pruning, and with that, remove the compute needed to run the network. Generally, we can remove uh, up to 80% of the weights, and for highly optimized models, we can actually get rid of 95% of the weight. So only keeping 5% of that network around that 5% was actually all that mattered to get the accuracy um, that, uh, that we have for our data set. So looking over on the right, we can look at uh, this fully connected network. And as we apply pruning, we're going to make it not so fully connected, right? So removing the weights and the connections in between these nodes. And that's what we call unstructured pruning. Additionally, most weights are too precise. Not only are they useless, but they're also too precise. The precision for training is no longer needed whenever we move into deployment. Um, so we can remove it through something called quantization. And that's where, and additionally with quantization, not only are we removing the precision, but we're also removing the compute and memory needed to run the network. Uh, and generally we can uh, quantize from the standard at, uh, floating point 32 down to an int eight. Uh, distribution and in some cases can push it to n4 or even 2 bit uh, quantization in, in terms of representation. So, just giving an example of this, this is um, an example distribution from a YOLO v5 model for the weights uh, at floating point 32. Whenever we go through quantization, we're going to quantize and put each of these weights into a bin that fits into an int 8 distribution, right? So, 0 to 255. And this enables that uh, compute and, uh, and memory speed up. As, uh, as we're talking through. So talking through results, as you can see on the right, we can get 7x faster for latency use cases, right? So this is our standard YOLO V5L, YOLO V5S. Pruning and quantizing it gets us this new line over here. So 7x faster for latency use cases, 12x faster for throughput, and 13x smaller file sizes. And these are the results that we have currently. So ultimately, sparsification is shifting the performance and accuracy Pareto curve past what was previously possible, right? So we have this previous curve that was established by the uh, YOLO v5 models, and we can shift that curve over to the left so that we, get, we end up having better performance um, at higher accuracy past what was possible through just doing standard compound scaling or scaling of the model sizes. So now that we have the background, let's go ahead and dive into a little bit on how do we actually apply this. So looking at sparse transfer, well, one, we want to create a sparse architecture, create on a large data set. 
So for us, generally we're creating them on uh, the Cocoa data set. And what we can then do is uh, we'll create on Cocoa, we can train and prune on that upstream data set. And once we have that Cocoa model, then we can fine tune it onto, uh, fine tune that sparse architecture that we have onto a smaller data set or any other data set that you might need. So this means something like uh, VOC or, uh, or maybe your own personal uh, data set that you've collected. So specifically, we're gonna keep the sparsity mass intact, right? That sparse architecture that we developed on this upstream, large upstream data set. We're gonna keep that sparse architecture intact and we're just gonna update the weights that aren't sparse. And the benefits of this is that uh, we don't need to do any sparsification hyperparams. We can just sub in this sparse architecture for our standard dense training. And it works as well or better than dense. And we have actually a few papers out on this uh, that have come out either in CBPR or, uh, or NeurIPS showing that uh, sparse transfer actually works just as well as dense and in some cases better, especially for generalization. So the downsides, uh, when comparing a sparsification from scratch, which we'll go through next, generally sparsification from scratch is gonna give a better trade-off and more fine-grained control on a large or out of distribution data sets. But provided that your data set, uh, provided that you're transfer learning right now, definitely move to sparse transfer. It's just as easy and you can apply it and get all the performance speed ups and, um, and the reduction in size. So what does this look like to actually apply through neural magic? Well, we have pre-sparsified models on Cocoa uh, available in the Sparsu. Sparsu is our, on our model repository and recipe repository. So it has all the models that we pre-sparsified as well as the recipes that we use to actually create those sparse models. Um, and additionally, we have easy to use APIs and CLIs that are built into SparseML, built on top of the Ultralytics package. So you can do pip install SparseML, and then you can run this command. I know the command looks a little long and uh, can, can be a little intimidating at first, but all that you're telling it is to do training on the v 5 train it onto the Cocoa 128 data set, so the smaller version of Cocoa. This is just an example to run through. Uh, you're going to tell it to do the yellow v5 model and to pull the weights for that from the sparse zoo. And then uh, you're going to give it a transfer recipe. And the recipe is just going to keep the sparse architecture intact while you're, while you're training. And then looking at uh, sparsifying from scratch. Well, this is when we're going to take a sparse architecture and create it on the desired data set for deployment. So we're gonna train, prune, and quantize on that data set, right? So going back to the examples from earlier, taking our fully connected network, we're gonna prune it down to this representation. And then additionally, we're gonna quantize it down so that our activations and weights become smaller. The benefits of this is that we can get higher accuracy for large data sets, right? Just think about if you were to prune on VOC and then try to transfer to Cocoa, not gonna work as well because Cocoa has a lot more information. So what we can do is get higher accuracy for large data sets and also make sure that the sparse architecture is fitted to the general solution for the exact data set that we want. Uh, additionally, we can prune custom models, some models that maybe we haven't pruned yet. Um, our tooling enables you to go through, create your own recipes and prune and quantize and ultimately sparsify these models so you can get better performance um, on deployment. Downsides, uh, there are hyperparameter tuning for sparsification that you have to go through. This is, these are things that we're working on making easier currently, where you have to figure out um, how, what level of sparsity you need to get to, uh, which portions of the model to quantize, things like that. Uh, but the same sparse ML CLIs and APIs are used to sparsify from scratch. Uh, so the same CLI that we went through earlier, sparseml.yolov5.train, uh, you can use that, plug in your own custom recipe to be able to prune and quantize these models. And uh, the recipes just change out to sparsify from scratch. If you'd like to see an example of these recipes, they're all available on our sparse uh, which we'll have links that go out after. And then, and then deploying. So once we have that sparse model, we wanna figure out how to move it into deployment, specifically with our deep sparse inference engine, which is specialized to get performance on these sparse models. So before deployment, we want to export it to the Onyx format. Uh, so Onyx is a general file format for representing neural networks as uh, available in Ultralytics in terms of the export pipeline. And it supports conversions from many standard frameworks such as PyTorch and, uh, and TensorFlow. And obviously Ultralytics being very popular with the PyTorch uh, framework. Deep Sparse takes in Onyx files as inputs and then it's going to run those for performance, which we'll go through an example of. 
One other thing that I wanted to call out is that deep sparse works not only with sparse models, but also with dense models as well. And it works very performantly with those, especially on, um, whenever we're looking at comparisons to honest runtime or open Vino or others, uh, deep sparse is actually going to lead the path in terms of dense model performance. So even if you don't want to go through all the sparse transfer and you already have a dense YOLO V5 model, uh, feel free to try and export to Onyx and then run it in deep sparse and you should see a significant performance improvement just from doing that. Uh, so the sparse ML has APIs and CLIs enabling exporting to Onyx that's again built on top of Ultralytics. Uh, so we do sparse ML that YOLO V5 dot export Onyx and then give it the path to the weights that we've trained. Uh, once we have that path in there, it's going to then export an Onyx model uh, that's uh, ready for deployment. And additionally, Sparsu contains these pre-exported Onyx models for benchmarking deployment. So if you just wanted to take, if you're deploying Cocoa right now, for example, you can take those models off the shelf straight from Sparsu and move directly into deployment and get all of those performance benefits without having to do any effort. So moving into what it looks like to try and do the setup for Deep Sparse and testing. So first we want to install Deep Sparse. It's available on PyPy, so we do pip install Deep Sparse. Uh, we're going to install a YOLO and server version. I'll get through the server in a second. YOLO just tells it to install a version that's compatible with Ultralytics. Uh, then we have the annotation API built into Deep Sparse. So you can do deepsparse.optionsdetection.annotate. And, uh, and it'll kick off with, uh, with one of our pre-sparse uh, pre models on uh, Sparse or you can plug in your own model and have it output. Additionally, we have a benchmarking API because that's what we want to make sure that people are aware of is the performance before they move into deployment, right? As soon as you're moving into deployment, uh, these object detection models can become pretty expensive to host and to consistently inference against. So benchmarking API can give us some idea of what, uh, what our performance is gonna look like and make sure that we can hit our whatever our frame rate, frame rate is or throughput rate that we need in terms of business use case, and then be able to assign it to a, um, assign it to performance and, and cost savings. So you can do deep sparse benchmark and then give it here, we're giving an example of a zoo stub, which is just the way to reference our zoo models on the sparse zoo. Uh, but additionally, you can give it any Onyx file and it will begin uh, benchmarking. Uh, and additional points on this is that it also supports Onyx runtime inside of here. So you can compare what the difference is between running in deep sparse and running is running in Onyx runtime, not only for sparse and spark quantized models, but additionally for your dense model. So then now that we've tested the model and made sure it's working both through annotate and benchmark, let's look at what it, what it takes to move into the format. So if we're working on an application or um, running something at the edge, uh, or just want to plug it in and uh, play with it in a demo, uh, demo. we can use the Deep Sparse Python API. So this is what it looks like. We're going to import a pipeline from Deep Sparse, uh, give it our model stub or our Onyx model, and then give it some images. Uh, these are just local files. So we're going to create a YOLO pipeline, uh, which is going to include all the pre-processing and post-processing necessary so that the output will just be the detection boxes uh, from running this model. And so you can see our pipeline outputs, we can just feed it in, feed in our images, and we can give it an IOU threshold and a confidence threshold based on what our hyperparameters found uh, to deploy these YOLO models. And then looking at the Deep Sparse server. So what this looks like, uh, and just to run through a little bit, we have the Deep Sparse server, which is an HTTP server built in to the installable for Deep Sparse. This makes it really easy to be able to plug it into um, uh, serving infrastructure such as Kubernetes uh, or SageMaker or others, whatever you might be serving the object detection models through for, um, for HTTP requests. So what you can do is do dsparse.server, tell it that we want to run a YOLO model, and then give it the path to that model. So here we're just giving an example of what that looks like whenever we're running uh, with a sparse model. But additionally, you can plug in your own Onyx model and it will begin, it'll spin it up and uh, make it available so that you can query into it as, as a normal HTTP request. Great. And then one other thing I want to call out is uh, the Deep Sparse licensing. So Deep Sparse is free to use for community and research purposes. Uh, commercially, it's available with full support and production-ready integrations. Uh, and you can reach out to us for getting a uh, 
these parts license as well as how to make your deployments faster, cheaper, and more accurate. Uh, so feel free to visit this product page. Uh, this will run you through the DSource engine as well as um, contacting uh, how to contact us to get in touch so that uh, we can help with your specific use case. And then looking through next steps. So what we're working on now is new research and models that are going to launch soon. Specifically, we're working on a refresh of all the YOLO v5 and YOLO v5 v6 models. Um, so currently we have YOLO v5s and YOLO v5l as our example models that are pushed up. And uh, what we want to do is improve the trade-off between performance and accuracy for those, as well as significantly expand out the selection to meet your deployment needs. So we are, act we are actively going through currently creating all the YOLO v5 and uh, the YOLO v5 v6 models. So that includes uh, N, S, M, X, or sorry, L and X. Uh, so that you can essentially, again, going back to that Pareto curve that we talked through, shifting the performance and accuracy to the left so that you can select which one works best for you. Additionally, we're working on improvements utilizing knowledge distillation. Knowledge distillation is something that's very popular on the NLP side. And uh, in our research through NLP, it works very, very well. Uh, so currently, we're actually working on better techniques to use knowledge distillation with YOLO v5. So what is knowledge distillation? Knowledge, knowledge distillation is where we can take a teacher model and essentially distill its knowledge and its accuracy into a smaller model or a compressed version. So for example, if we're detecting, uh, uh, detecting a large range of classes and maybe we have buses and trucks and cars, the model we're training may get the bus wrong and the class label on that is just going to give it a signal to say that, no, this isn't a bus. Right. But with a teacher, what we can do is actually adjust our loss surface so that um, so that we're telling it not only is it not a bus, but it's also similar in visual appearance to a truck and a car. Um, so just in that same way of trying to compress down the smaller models, we can also use use knowledge distillation to uh, increase the level of uh, sparsification we're able to get to. So prune it to a higher level and increase our recovery. So stay tuned for that research as we're pushing it out. Additionally, we're working with, uh, with Glenn and the rest of the Ultralytics team now so that we can get native integrations with the Ultralytics repo. Um, so this means tutorials built in and all of the tooling built in that we have in SparseML and DeepSparse will become available through the Ultralytics repo. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll also have that coming out. And then to visit our website, uh, to stay in touch, visit our website. This has, you know, this will link you out to all of our different research as well as all of our different products. And uh, you can feel free to use our repos. We're on GitHub. Again, everything we're doing is either open source or free to use. Uh, so feel free to run through our repos. SparseML is the one that's used for uh, sparsifying models uh, to be, and it plugs into most pipelines with only a single, or with only a few lines of code. And uh, DeepSparse is our inference engine, which gets uh, state-of-the-art performance on CPUs. And uh, the sparse is where we store all of our models and recipes. And also feel free to join the community. Uh, all of our ML engineers and ML team, as well as our product team, are active in our Slack community, especially. So any questions that you have, any issues that, we, uh, that you have, feel free to uh, ask in our Slack community. We can run through with you. And then finally, we are software, uh, software delivered AI and we're hiring. So if you're looking for, um, for new jobs, especially for full stack or for um, uh, ML engineering, as well as some product uh, positions we're hiring. So feel free to stop by neuromagic.com careers. And thank you everyone for listening.